I was about 13, and I had experiences before. Some were very intense, but this was the worst of them all. A lot of weird occurrences happened, such as my mom hearing my voice screaming at my cat when I was at school, the silverware clashing around the drawers, opening and slamming, things like money disappearing and showing up in strange places, or not at all. I noticed some red droplets on the floor next to the side of my bed, like bright artery red. I never figured out what it was, and I couldn't get it out of the carpet. Once, I was home alone, and I saw with my own eyes a smoky white figure appear in the kitchen. It just materialized out of nowhere. I sat there stunned and watched, but when it started moving, I ran and stayed in the driveway until someone came home. But what changed everything for me was when I fell asleep on my back one night. I always slept with the TV or the lights on. I did not want to be alone in the dark. Pirates of the Caribbean 3 was playing, and the music box in the intro before you press play usually calmed me. When I opened my eyes, a young woman was hovering above me. She was very still, like she was standing, no expression on her face. She had pale white skin like porcelain and wore a sky blue dress with white lacing. It looked old, ancient. She had black hair a little longer than mine. I was sleep deprived at that point from being terrorized every night and my brain wasn't working correctly. I didn't register her. I just turned over and fell asleep. The dream I had was horrifying. I was in the pitch black, and I felt something made of pure malice, hate, and frankly evil in the room with me. I sat up and started leaping toward my door. I didn't even get close. Suddenly, I opened my eyes and returned to bed in the dark. It kept going. I felt like I was fighting to get to the door. Each time I would get closer, I opened my eyes at some point, and she stood beside my bed. I got a good look at her. She didn't have the top half of her head. It wasn't gory like you're probably imagining. From the nose up, it was just faded into nothing. It simply... I wasn't there. Then she smiled at me. I can't describe what it was like, but that smile was the worst thing I've ever seen. Everything appeared normal on her face. Perhaps the smile was a bit stretched, but it was normal. It made my blood turn to ice because I could see the evil in it, and I was at her mercy. Somehow, she forced me back into the dream. Eventually, I got to the point where I touched the doorknob. I finally woke up in the early morning, maybe around 6 a.m. The music box theme of the movie was still playing, and the TV was still on. I was tortured that entire night. I ran out of my room, so I knew it was real. I was free and alive. Later, I misdescribed her to my mom's boyfriend, who's sensitive to the paranormal. I said she didn't have eyes, and he saw something similar but it wasn't like she had black holes where her eyes should be. He said he saw a girl that he thought was me sitting at the end of their bed one night, but her head faded. He rubbed his eyes, and the woman was gone. I was shocked someone else had seen her, and they were telling the truth. The last experience was before I got sick a couple of days later. I was in the hospital with my second pulmonary embolism. I genuinely think I narrowly escaped something unimaginable. My mom, her boyfriend, and I sat at the dining room table. I felt her presence materialize in another part of the house. That's never happened before or since. The chandelier above the table started swinging back and forth in a circle. We all stood up. I felt her coming closer. She had shown up in their bathroom and was coming through their room into the dining room. I had two cats at the time. They lost it, raised hissing, spitting, and they took off into the bedroom. 
I felt her on the move. She came through the dining room, but I couldn't see anything. Nobody saw her, but I thought of her. The cats chased her through the house, into the living room, and into the hallway to my room. Then, into my room. Once she entered my room, I felt that heavy presence disappear. The chandelier lost momentum. My cats let their guard down and returned to the dining room, acting like nothing had happened. I'll never forget it ever. My then husband and I moved into a townhouse style apartment when I was still relatively newly married. The two floors of our apartment were on the second and third floors of the building and the management office and mailbox area were almost directly below us on the ground. So I used some diapers from the diaper bag, kept the baby wrapped in a towel, and cuddled up to stay warm. I stayed down there the rest of the day until my husband got home. Every so often, I'd look up the stairs at the bathroom, but I didn't want to take the baby up there, and I was afraid to leave him alone downstairs. When he asked me why the baby wasn't dressed, I told him about the heater and the smoke in the bathroom, and he went up to check, figuring it was yet another maintenance issue. There were no electrical issues, damage to the outlet, smoke, or cigarette smell. He put the heater back on the counter and turned it on. He watched it for a few minutes, and it didn't rock. He laughed it off. But we heard our landlord's adult son downstairs near the mailboxes, yelling his head off at people later that day. That's when we found out she'd had a massive heart attack in her office earlier that day, and her son had found her dead in her chair, with a camel non-filter still in her hand. This happened way back in October of 2006. I was just a 19-year-old kid, always looking for adventure. Then one Friday night, after wrapping up my shift at McDonald's, I met up with some friends who suggested we check out this haunted location called Wits Bridge. My buddy Brandon said he had recently learned about it and began telling us the legends associated with the 100-year-old wood-covered bridge. Never one to turn down a spooky experience, we all piled into my green Ford Taurus and headed out on our journey. Brandon gave directions, guiding me off the main road, and within minutes, we were on the dirt back roads surrounded by woods and cornfields. Our only reference point was a blinking cell tower off in the distance. We could tell we were going further from the city as our cell phones began slowly losing service. As we rode more profoundly into what legitimately felt like the absolute middle of nowhere, Brandon repeated the legend associated with the bridge. Back in the early 1900s, a local farmer discovered that his beloved wife had been cheating on him. In a fit of rage, he killed her and her lover after finding them in the act. After committing the cold-blooded murder, the farmer left his home and wandered the dirt roads in a daze. He eventually came upon White's Bridge, where the realization of what he had done finally began to sink in, and he decided he would rather die than face the consequences of his actions. He hoisted a rope up and over one of the bridge's rafters and hung himself. As far as I can tell now, the story is completely fiction, but we believed it at the time. After a long and bumpy ride, Brandon instructed me to turn right and off the road. I wouldn't have even noticed it was there if he had not pointed it out. I took the turn, and there before us was White's Bridge. It looked like something straight out of a horror film. An old, wood-covered bridge, aged by time, sitting alone above a river, deep in the middle of nowhere. We parked the car on the side of the road, and got out to explore. Immediately catching our eyes was a scarecrow lying abandoned 
at the entrance of the bridge. My friend Mike, known as somewhat of a risk taker and a stupid one, picked up the scarecrow and lit it on fire. The hay body burst into flames and Mike waved it around proudly next to the old dry wood bridge. Realizing the risk, I told him to throw the damn thing in the river and put it out, which thankfully he did after making sure there weren't any rogue embers that could ignite the bridge. Brandon suggested we get back into the car and pull it onto the bridge. He explained that the legend was that if you parked your car in the middle of the bridge, put it in neutral, and killed the engine, the spirit of the dead farmer would push the vehicle forward to get it off the bridge. Naturally, we had to try this. We piled back in and did exactly what he said. We parked halfway across the rickety old bridge and killed the engine. We sat in the pitch black, saying nothing, waiting for anything to happen. The only sounds were the bridge creaking, the river flowing beneath us, and footsteps. Suddenly, the back driver's side door opened, and a woman abruptly entered the back seat, cramming next to my two friends. She looked to be in her late twenties or early thirties, with long, straight black hair, was slim, and wore a plaid shirt with blue jeans. It's been a while, but this is how I remember the conversation. I saw your fire signal for me, she. Before, they warned about the bridge's instability and advised against stopping on it. As the headlights revealed the signs, an eerie feeling settled over us. My friends exchanged uneasy glances. I turned to Brandon and asked, did she say her boyfriend's car broke down on this side of the bridge? Yeah, that's what she said, he replied, his voice filled with uncertainty. The situation felt increasingly surreal and a sense of unease gripped us. I decided to proceed with caution, slowly driving down the narrow road. It was dimly lit with the surrounding trees casting shadows that seemed to dance in the moonlight. We reached a point where the road widened and there, parked on the side, was a car with its hazard lights on. I approached cautiously and we saw a guy standing next to the vehicle, seemingly distressed. He looked up as our headlights illuminated him, relief washing over his face. That's her boyfriend, Mike whispered. I rolled down the window and asked if he needed help. He explained that his car had broken down and he was grateful for our arrival. Without delving into the bizarre encounter with the woman, we offered him a ride back to the nearest town, which he gladly accepted. As we drove away from the bridge, leaving the mysterious woman behind, a heavy silence hung in the air. None of us spoke about the strange incident until we dropped the boyfriend off, and he thanked us before heading into the town. Afterward, we continued our journey home the eerie encounter at White's Bridge lingering in our minds. The story became a peculiar chapter in our shared memories, one that would be retold many times, each recounting carrying the weight of uncertainty and the inexplicable. From the bridge, no trespassing, private property, and do not enter. Looking up the road, there was no sign of the woman. Wherever she went, it didn't appear that she went that way. I didn't want to stick around, so I backed up and crossed the bridge again, and from there began the journey home. We didn't have much to say on the ride home. I think we were all equally stunned, except for Mike, who asked if he knew anyone who could be awake at this hour to score some weed. I visited White's Bridge several other times after that, but nothing happened on my subsequent visits. Sadly, some delinquents burned down the old White's Bridge some years ago. It was rebuilt, 
but from what I hear, not the same as the original. I don't have any plans to go back and check it out. I live in Florida, and this incident happened about three weeks after Hurricane Irma, so it was not long ago. Back in July, my ex and I had just finalized the divorce, and I moved into a gated neighborhood where every house was rented out by the same rental company. It's a tiny neighborhood with about 15 houses, all bordered around a man-made lake with the backyards facing the lake. Not one has a fenced backyard. When you walk out your back door, you see the lake in front of you and your neighbor's backyard on each side. Everyone in the neighborhood seemed very close. Someone was always hosting a family-friendly party barbecue or having people over to watch sports. I was still depressed about my divorce, so I never partook in any of these social gatherings. The only person I got to know was my next door neighbor, Steve, an active Navy soldier with a huge love for guns. Steve is the true hero in this nightmare. My daughter Alice is four years old and I get her every weekend. Alice's bedroom window faces the backyard towards the lake. I spoil that girl to death. She is my everything. And I count the days to the weekend every week just to be with her. That's why I was upset when Irma came and I had to go almost three weekends without seeing her. The weekend before the storm, she was with her mom. The, the weekend before the storm, she was with her mom. Obviously, the weekend of the storm, she was with her mom. On top of that, the weekend after, she still had to be with her mom because my power was still out. The humidity was so bad that I slept in my daughter's room the whole week because it was the only room with a window facing the lake. I opened the window, exposing just the window screen so the breeze from the lake could cool the room as much as possible while I slept. Eventually, the power returned, and Alice revisited me like normal. That was when the nightmare started. My daughter would complain about the singing lady and how she doesn't like her anymore. Maybe she was just referring to one of my ex's friends or teachers at her school. Perhaps a teacher at her school sang a song to the kids that she didn't like. That Saturday night, Alice woke up in the middle of the night, screaming bloody murder. I ran into her room, turned on the light, and found her hiding under her covers. I asked her what was wrong, and she could only point to an empty corner of her room and say, look, look. There was nothing there. She was acting as if she saw a ghost. After I calmed her down, she started to talk about the singing lady again. Please tell me the singing lady is not coming back. Please, Daddy, make her go away. I showed her that there was nothing in the closet or under the bed, and that there was nothing to be afraid of. She calmed down and went back to sleep. I went back to my room and quickly fell back asleep. It couldn't have been more than 20 minutes before. Alice came running into my room, screaming, She's back! She's back! Alice refused to return to her room, so I let her sleep with me. The next morning, Sunday morning, I took Alice out for breakfast, and we stopped by Target to pick up a baby monitor. I hadn't used one since her mom and I were still married, but I wanted to easily be able to hear if and when she started having these nightmares again, so I could respond quickly. After I set them up, I showed Alice how they worked to assure her that I could hear her and that she was safe. That night, she slept soundly and didn't make a peep. The following weekend, Alice had to stay with her mother again because she caught a stomach virus from one of her little friends at school. It was Saturday night and I was sound asleep in my bed. Around 2 a.m., I heard a woman's voice humming a soft nursery rhyme through the baby monitor. The humming got louder and clearer as the voice approached the monitor. 
I wasn't dreaming. I could hear a woman softly singing a lullaby in my daughter's bedroom. I had never been so scared and dumbfounded in my life. I was feeling a mixture of pure terror and disbelief. Then the voice said, Alice, sweetie, are you awake? Adrenaline shot through my veins. I jumped out of bed and locked my bedroom door. I picked up my cell and called Steve from next door. He didn't waste a second. As soon as I got off the phone, I heard him storm out of his back door, screaming, Don't you move! I ran outside and found him aiming his shotgun at a woman crouched outside my daughter's window, the one I had left open after Irma and never closed. Steve quickly dropped his guard when he recognized the woman. It was Jean, the neighborhood maintenance woman. Steve's wife came running out after him and confirmed it was her. Sean was disoriented and confused, not making much sense. We called the police and they took her away for a psychiatric evaluation. It turns out she had been experiencing a severe mental health episode and had wandered into our neighborhood. Steve and I, shaken by the incident, spent the rest of the night making sure all our windows were securely closed, and the neighborhood returned to its quiet, seemingly serene state. By her story either, the police took her away for a psychiatric evaluation, and the neighborhood returned to its quiet, seemingly serene state. Later, during the investigation, Jean played dumb. She claimed she was not singing and didn't even know my daughter's name. She said she was near my daughter's window because she was doing her weekly patrol for gators and thought that she saw one approaching our house from the lake. I called her out, stating that she was singing and called out to my daughter by name, yes. There have indeed been a few gator sightings around the neighborhood. And yes, part of Jean's job was to patrol the lake at night now and then. But at 2 a.m., I knew this was a lie. And even though neither Steve nor his wife called her out on it, I could tell from the looks on their faces that they didn't buy her story either. The incident left me deeply unsettled, questioning the safety and security of our supposedly close-knit community, I became more vigilant, ensuring that all windows and doors were securely locked each night. The trauma lingered, affecting both Alice and me. Nightmares haunted her sleep, and the eerie hum of the singing lady echoed in my mind during the quiet hours of the night. In the aftermath, Steve and I became even closer friends bound by the shared experience of protecting our families. We formed a tight-knit alliance, regularly checking on each other's homes and families. The once seemingly idyllic neighborhood now carried an air of suspicion, a shadow that lingered despite Jean's removal from the community. The singing lady's haunting melody had faded, but the scars it left on our sense of security remained a chilling reminder that darkness could creep into the most unsuspecting corners of our lives, and told me Jean and her husband have been known to be a little cuckoo. But this is by far the craziest thing to happen. Steve helped me install metal bars on Alice's window that afternoon. We both agreed it was an extra layer of precaution that might provide some peace of mind. Over the following weeks, life slowly returned to a semblance of normalcy. Alice's nightmares became less frequent, and the singing lady's memory began to fade. However, the incident had left an indelible mark on our lives. I became hyper-aware of the potential dangers lurking in our seemingly serene surroundings. The neighborhood, once characterized by camaraderie, took on a different tone people were more cautious, exchanging guarded glances. The trust that had once defined our community was fractured, replaced by a collective wariness. 
we no longer left our doors unlocked, and the sense of safety we had previously taken for granted had been shattered. As time passed, the scars of that fateful night healed, but the echoes of the singing lady lingered. The incident served as a harsh reminder that darkness could seep into the most unsuspecting corners of our lives, even within the confines of a seemingly tight-knit community. <laughs>